It was 2011 and I was fresh out of the Navy. I had decided to move back home to the family farm with my folks in Michigan until I could get established on my own. However, this was right after the market crash of 2008 and it took longer than anticipated to get back on my feet so I ended up living with them for a while longer than originally planned. And my mother had grown accustomed to having me around to help with mowing the lawn, raking leaves, and shoveling snow, so she specifically asked me to stay and help, and so I agreed. Unfortunately, the farmhouse my parents own, and had been in the family for generations, burned down, and so they moved into town and were renting. They found a nice house for a reasonable amount and signed a lease. I initially moved with them, but now that there was no more farm to take care of, I started looking for a new place to live. My mother again insisted on me staying with them and after discussing it with my significant other, it was decided that I would stay with the folks in order to save up money for the future. After living in the same house for a few years, we found out that the owner had mortgaged the house to heaven and back and it was being foreclosed on. Me and the folks found yet another house and lived there until the owner decided he wanted to retire from being a landlord and so sold it off meaning no renewed lease and therefore they had to find a new place to live again. We ended up stuck in a little house in a bad neighborhood which had no front porch light. I was again considering leaving for a more stable living condition but at this point my long term girlfriend had become my fiance and I really needed to save up money for our future wedding and so I stayed. Several things happened around that little house on the bad street that eventually scared my parents into buying a new house. Some of these events were just the result of living in a bad neighborhood. For example, there was a house down the street that the cops raided a few times in the year we lived on that street because they were running a brothel out of the house. A church on the street got broken into and robbed more than once. A house got burned down by an arsonist. A woman was dragged out of her home by the sheriff after the homeowner reported her for lack of rental payments. A guy across the street was being arrested almost weekly for domestic violence. Another up the street got raided a couple of times for selling drugs. Another had all of his windows covered up with confederate flags and liked following people down the street preaching all sorts of terrible things that were incredibly offensive that I can't even repeat here. Just a lot of super messed up stuff. And if he wasn't already charming enough, the guy eventually got arrested after trying to sell his own home brews, moonshine, and meth to a bunch of kids. All sorts of other crazy drama on that street. But none of those things are really what convinced my parents to buy a new place and move. The following are those events. Shortly after moving into the new place, my parents went out to spend time with friends one night, and I was at home talking with my fiancé over Skype as she was in Ireland at the time. It was a warm summer's evening in early September, and the little house had no air conditioning, so I had the front door open to let air in through the screen door and my bedroom door open so I wasn't roasting alive. From where I was sitting at my PC in my bedroom, I had a straight shot view out my bedroom door to the front door. As my fiancé and I talked, I heard what sounded like the latch to the front screen door. I looked toward the door but saw nothing. Assuming it was the wind rattling the screen door, I continued my conversation. Then I heard it again and I watched the door for a moment to see if I could see the branches of the trees or the leaves blowing and swaying in the wind. There was no wind, so when I heard the latch jiggling a third time, I got up and went to investigate. And as I walked outside, there was a man walking off the side of the front porch and away from the house. I called after him, asking if there was something he needed, but he ignored me completely. As this was happening, my parents were arriving home and saw the man crossing our driveway at an angle that made it obvious that he had been on our porch, with me standing on the porch calling after him. He walked into the neighbor's house and disappeared from sight. My dad turned to me and asked, What's happening? What did that guy want? I proceeded to tell him how I had kept hearing the latch on the screen door and when I attempted to investigate, I found this guy on our porch and bailing as quickly as possible. And when I asked what he needed, he just ignored me and ran off. My dad then walked over to the neighbor's to ask about this odd behavior. He wouldn't come to the door at first, but when he finally did, he claimed he was just looking to bump some cigarettes. My dad handed him a few, then asked why he hadn't just knocked and if he needed cigarettes, 
Why had he run when asked what he wanted? I should note here that my dad had accidentally left an almost full pack on his porch chair and it hadn't been bothered. So naturally we didn't believe him and instead of answering my dad's questions, he just ran off into the house somewhere. My dad then found himself talking to an older couple and found out through the old couple that they owned the house next door and that the weird guy was their son who'd just gotten out of prison for theft-related crimes. He got caught about six weeks later breaking into another neighbor's house. The homeowner called the cops and he was found to have violated his parole and was sent back to jail. But that's not the end of the story. Shortly after the man next door tried to sneak into the house while I was still there, we started having an issue where someone had tried to get into the back door. We come home from grocery shopping or something and the back gate would be open and the screen door on the back door would be swinging in the breeze. This went for a while until one day we came home, found the back gate open again and when we went to close the back screen door there were tool marks on the door jam like someone had tried jimmying the back door. We found a small pry bar in the tall grass next to the back porch and we realized that the only reason to leave it there was as if the culprit had dropped it while running away as quickly as possible. Say for example if he needed to beat a hasty retreat over the back fence as the residents pulled up. At this point my dad had had enough of the guy who had been next door, whoever was trying to get in through the back door, and he had some concerns about the creepy and likely crazy neo-Nazi down the street and so he decided some cameras would be useful and started to price things. He ended up getting some trail cams that could be plugged in to recharge, were motion activated as trail cams usually are, and could be easily mounted. He put one facing toward the back door where the camera could see through the window in the back door, and he mounted the other where it could see out the front door. These cameras were about to prove that they were worth it. We'd been in the place a few months now, and it was early March and we had a snow overnight. I awoke to find four inches of the driveway so I shoveled the snow out of the driveway real quick before heading off to work. My dad woke up about an hour later and also left for work leaving my mother home alone. According to her sometime during mid-morning, she was surprised by a knock at the door and when she answered it, there was a man there, stocky, around 5'7", with a goatee offering snow removal services. My mother looked at the driveway and found it devoid of snow. When she looked back at the guy, he looked like he was trying to peer around her into the house. She shut him down, telling him that she clearly didn't need snow removal and closed the door on his face. As she did, she heard him kick the screen door as if though he was attempting to put his foot in the door, as he insisted that he could do snow removal for just a nominal fee. She ignored him and he eventually wandered off. She told me and my dad about it later, but there just wasn't much to the story. Some idiot offered snow removal to people who don't need it. Not exactly the Amityville horror, so we kind of just brushed it off. A few weeks later in early April, my parents went on a cruise for my mother's birthday, leaving me alone in the house. I had been in the house alone for a few days when some guy showed up at around 8.30pm, pitch black night outside, saying he was from the gas company that provided our gas company with natural gas and he needed to come in and see our gas bills to make sure we were not being overcharged. I was immediately wary of the man as he matched the description my mother had given me about the snow removal guy a month earlier, and it was 8.30pm. The gas company closed at 5. It was possible people would be doing overtime, but for three and a half hours after closing, going door to door in the cold Michigan spring, it seemed unlikely. He was wearing an ID on a lanyard around his neck, but he kept his hands over the actual ID, and he flashed it at me so fast that I couldn't really see it. To be honest, what I did see looked like the back of a Topps baseball card with the player's stats. Then he actually tried to push past me into the house, but I put my hand on his shoulder and pushed him back, while telling him no at the same time. He insisted that he was just making sure we weren't being cheated and then pointed to the only other house on the street with no front porch light and said that they'd just come over there and that they managed to cut over 10% off their gas bills. I cut him off and told him that not only was it late but it did not go over my head that his best and only example of his work was the only other poorly lit house with no front porch light that I found it very suspicious that he actually expected me to just show him private financial information on the gas bill, nor did I believe the gas company would have people out so late. 
I told him he needed to leave and he responded by trying to push past me again, again telling me it was fine and that he was just there to help. I pushed him back again, more aggressively this time and almost pushed him backward off the porch firmly telling him no I wasn't going to show him anything and that he needed to leave. I told him that it was not okay that he'd repeatedly tried to enter the house without permission, nor was it fine that he repeatedly demanded to see private financial information. Then I looked him in the eyes and as confidently as possible told him that this intrusion felt more to me like he was casing the house for burglary and I would be calling the cops immediately after closing the door. And then I warned him that I was former military and that I had a firearm and if I saw him around my house again that I absolutely would shoot him. Now I'm not a psycho, I had no real want to shoot anybody, but I needed him to know that I had the means, capability, and willingness to defend myself in the home if necessary. He slowly walked off the porch as I closed the door and he started down the street. I watched him through the windows walk right past all the well-lit houses of my neighbors. As he walked away, it occurred to me that there should be some sort of company vehicle. If he really was from the gas company as he claimed there should be some sort of service truck or company car with a logo or rental tags. So I went out onto the front porch and looked up and down the street to find no one. There was neither. However, as I looked back toward him, he was signaling at someone who came from behind some bushes on a side street near the house, literally less than 10 yards away. The guy was taller and skinnier than his friend, like sickly and frail skinny, but somehow he still had an aura of danger about him. The first guy made me feel slightly uneasy, but this guy made me feel chilled to the core and he wore an oversized hooded sweater that, in the darkness, completely hid his facial features, giving him the look like the Grim Reaper. He kept pointing at the house, and his body language kept getting more and more forceful. I could tell he wanted to come back to the house for whatever reason, but the first guy didn't, and I couldn't help but wonder what their plan was that the accomplice wanted so much to complete. What would have happened if I had actually let this guy into the house? At this point, I followed through with my promise and pulled out my cell phone and called the police non-emergency line and reported him. I was on the phone with the officer taking my statement when the fake gas guy and his friend turned and started pointing at the house. That's when they realized that I was still watching them from the porch and the first guy began to run off down the street. However, his accomplice just stood and looked in my direction as I spoke to the officer. I don't know how I know this as I couldn't see his face with that giant hood up in the dark of night but I could tell that he was staring at me, and as I watched him I realized I couldn't look away from him. I felt like I had just entered a battle of wills and if I looked away, it would end badly for me, so I just stood there and watched him with chills dancing up and down my spine. After what felt like a small eternity, but what had to have been only several seconds of the staring contest, he looked away slowly and nonchalantly made his way down the street to catch up with the fake gas guy. I realized I'd only been holding my breath and let out a long sigh. The officer was asking me if I was still on the line and it occurred to me that I had just dropped off mid-conversation with the person on the other end. My knees felt weak and I needed to sit down so I went inside and locked the door. The police promised to send a patrolman around to take a look for anything suspicious and told me to call back if they came back. I hung up the phone and loaded my rifle. I was alone in a bad neighborhood with a couple of random guys casing the house, one of which was clearly not right in the head. I felt the rifle was appropriate, but I prayed I had scared the guys off so it wouldn't be necessary. I went to bed with the rifle on my desk, ready to go just in case. I was woken up from a fitful sleep by my phone a couple of hours later. The patrolman had caught the guys pulling the same shtick at another house with no porch light down the street. The creepy one was hiding around the corner of the house when the patrol car pulled up. I had to go in the next day to confirm that they were the same people. While I never got a clear look at the accomplice's face, I was able to identify the person who knocked on my door. I read up on them in the paper a little while later. Apparently they were looking for victims to rob, or so they claimed. The accomplice apparently had several large knives on him when he was arrested, hidden under his giant hoodie, leading police to believe that he, at least, had other plans than just burglary. When confronted with these questions, they took plea deals in exchange for confessions. 
The one with the knives got his parole revoked and found himself back in jail with an extra couple of years tacked onto his original sentence. The door knocker got 30 days in the county jail, 100 days community service, $1,000 fine and one year probation. When my parents got back from their cruise, I told them what happened and my mother rushed over to the trail cams. She found early March and the pictures of the snow removal guy and they went to the day in question and found pictures of the gas company guy. They were the same guy. Near as we can figure because my dad and I work long hours and were typically gone most of the day. The only person I'd ever seen leaving and entering the house was my mother who was a tiny old lady and so they assumed that she'd lived alone. Then when he showed up late at night a couple of weeks later and instead of a lonely old lady there was a six foot three military vet telling him no you're not coming in and it bungled up whatever they were planning. I'll tell you what though, there was something about the accomplice that scared me. Maybe it was because he was hiding in the bushes the whole time me and his friend were having our exchange, or the fact that he kept his face hidden by an oversized hood. But before he ever even noticed me standing there, I could feel the danger emanating off of him, like warning bells going off in my head, and it felt like he just loathed my entire being and wanted me to suffer for simply existing. The way he stared at me from under the dark shadows of his hood was almost inhuman. I took some time off of work, used up some of my savings, and went to Europe to see my fiancé. I just needed to get away from that house for a while. While I was in Europe, my parents quickly bought up a house on the very edge of town, away from bad neighborhoods, and moved into it. When I got back from vacation, I asked them why they decided to buy all of a sudden, and they just told me that they never wanted to rent again after that house. I began moving into my new one-bedroom apartment with my boyfriend the day after the old lease ended. My apartment was small in size and on the bottom floor. There was a window in the bedroom that faces the outside walkway and the front door to our apartment. I spent the whole day carrying boxes from my boyfriend's truck to the apartment. I noticed a dirty-looking man in a rusty, beat-up red Toyota staring at us while we moved each box. He looked about 40, had round glasses with a very thin frame, his hair was stringy and thinning at the top and looked as if though it had once been white but yellow due to lack of cleanliness. I wouldn't have given his gaze much thought except he had been sitting in his car for nearly two hours now. Not waiting for anyone it seemed, just staring at us, moving his head to keep his gaze as we moved from the truck to our building. I told my boyfriend and he just shrugged it off, telling me that maybe he was just a neighbor trying to see who moved in. We just ignored the man and finished unloading boxes before settling in for the night. Fast forward to the next night. My boyfriend and I had unpacked most of the kitchen so we were having a late dinner and ended up drinking some wine. It was about 12.30am and we were just talking and hanging out when we heard a slight tap on the window. It was strange. It wasn't as if those someone were knocking on it but more like as if someone had accidentally hit it with an object of some sort. I peeked through the blinds to find nothing but darkness outside. Without giving it a second thought, my boyfriend and I finished our dinner and wine, turned out the lights and went to bed. We awoke at around 2am to a soft knock on the door. My boyfriend, very tired and very irritated, got up from the bed to check the peephole to see who could possibly be trying to reach us at such an hour. He looked through the peephole to find a man standing outside the door, staring directly into the peephole. He sneakily made his way to our room, carefully trying not to make any sound so whoever it was outside couldn't hear movement within the apartment. He went up to me and shook my leg a little bit, whispering that there was some creepy old man outside our door, just staring at it. I awoke immediately and slowly went to the window to see who it was. The blinds were raised only an inch or so, so I tried to identify the man using the small sliver of window that was exposed. I saw a hand tapping on the window, tapping as if he was patiently waiting for someone to open the door for him. I froze in fear and waited. We heard the man turn around and leave. My boyfriend checked the front door to confirm he wasn't outside our door anymore as I was terrified to even peek out the window. We were so bugged out that we didn't end up sleeping much for the rest of the night. 
The next day, we were really anxious and worried about the situation, so we spoke with our front office and tried to explain what had happened. The front office basically said that maybe someone thought that they were at the right apartment building and that it was just a mistake or a misunderstanding. It wasn't that big of a deal and we needed to just not worry about it, they made it seem. They said if it happened again, to try to identify the person or talk to them to see what they wanted. Great advice, right? Later that night, we left the front porch light on to feel a little bit more safe. We locked all the doors and windows and cuddled in bed with the lights off while watching some TV show on low volume. Eventually, we drifted off to sleep. I woke around 2.20am to my boyfriend tapping on me, whispering, He's back. Wide-eyed with fear. I let out a small gasp. My boyfriend handed me a small pistol and said, Don't shoot unless you need to, and left the room. I was completely terrified, confused, and worried at this point, and decided to try and see who this creep was. I once again looked through the small sliver of window that was showing, but could only see their bottom half. I made my way to the front door where my boyfriend was, his face glued to the peephole. I asked if I could take a look, and instantly I could make out who it was. I saw the yellow, thinning hair and the glasses. It was the same man that was watching us move in a few days ago. I took a step back and began to silently freak out. We heard the man knock silently again on the door. He leaned in real close to the peephole, startling my boyfriend and causing him to let out a small gasp. The man leaned back, turned around and immediately walked upstairs. We waited. We never saw him come back down. We never heard movement in the upstairs apartment either. Frightened, we went back to bed and didn't sleep until the sun came up. As soon as the office opened, we went in to report the incident, and one of the leasing managers looked distressed. She went on to tell them that this was the fifth report on similar incidents made by multiple tenants throughout the apartment complex. She told us that they were looking into it to find out who this person was. For about a week, we heard nothing, and no one came to the door during the dark hours of the night. We began to get back into our normal routine and paid no mind to the weirdness that we had experienced. About three weeks after the last incident, we received a call from the front office. Apparently, there was a disturbed tenant that lived in the complex that had always had really random and weird complaints about him. He was an older man, apparently had some issues in his past. They were calling to let us know that he was the one who had been randomly knocking on doors and sneaking around multiple buildings in the complex. They said that he had been evicted due to his behavior and that we wouldn't have to deal with it again. They apologized, then hung up, and that was that. We never heard weird noises in the night or saw his car in the parking lot after that. We continued to live out the rest of our lease and eventually moved out to a nicer apartment complex across town. It always stuck with me. I always got skittish during the nights and would check the windows multiple times before bed. I think the strangest thing to me was that the building we lived in wasn't even remotely close to the one that he apparently resided in. He had watched us move in and decided that's who he wanted to creep on in the middle of the night. If there's one thing that I learned, it's to listen to what that gut feeling inside is telling you. Always be aware of your surroundings and be careful with who is paying attention when you are not. It was the summer of 2007, and my best friend and his girlfriend suggested I get a date and we all go to some local hot pots, which are natural hot springs located deep in a nearby canyon not too far from where we lived in Utah. Supposedly, these hot pots were awesome, super quick and easy to get to, just a short hike from where you park your car off the main road running through the canyon. It must have been around 7pm that day when we parked the truck in Spanish Fork Canyon and set off on the trail that led to the natural hot springs, armed only with our swimming suits and towels. I don't know where my friend got his bad information, but it was definitely not a super quick and easy hike to the hot pots, more like a difficult hike that took over an hour on a very narrow path where we had to walk single file the whole time, and occasionally over some treacherous spots where one bad step would send you cascading down the mountain. It seemed like it would never end, and we'd never get to those hot springs, but... After wearing ourselves out and not being adequately prepared, we made it. 
The sun was setting as we finally reached the clearing where the natural pools were dug out from the ground. It was later than we expected, but we figured it would be fun to soak in the hot water underneath the stars. We were so deep in the canyon at this point that the stars in the sky were brighter than any other time I've ever seen in my life. No light pollution at all. We had probably been there for about 30 minutes and had the entire area to ourselves, just having a great time telling jokes and making each other laugh. The only light was from the stairs and the only sounds were from us. The quiet was almost eerie. Suddenly, we started to hear twigs snapping in the direction we came from. See, there was only one way in and out from the hot pots. That super narrow trail we hiked in on, which ended at the pools. Soon, we could make out the outline of a figure in the dark, someone with a flashlight coming down the trailhead to the pools we were swimming in. I was in a great mood up until this point, and since this person's arrival had taken us all by surprise, I yelled out to them once I was confident that they would be able to hear me, to try and break the ice from any awkwardness, and also partly as a defense mechanism from the nervousness I was feeling all of a sudden. Hey! You here to join the party? Silence. The person keeps walking towards us and doesn't say a word. Immediately, alarm bells are going off in my head. My gut is telling me that something is not right here. I try to ignore how I'm feeling and make a joke to our group about the person being a weirdo for not answering, but now everyone else is on edge as well. As the person begins to get closer, we can start to make out a little more than what we had been able to see before. It's a man, above average size, dressed head to toe in black. This guy was wearing a hoodie and long pants in the middle of summer in Utah. Who does that? We notice he's also wearing a black backpack before he gets to the clearing and turns off his flashlight. He continues walking towards us. Now, there are half a dozen hot pots scattered around this clearing. There is no one else around except us. He has his pick of any of them to swim in, but no. He walks directly towards ours and sits down about six feet from where we were soaking. My friend has a lantern, so he hops to the side of the pool and grabs it and turns it on. Wait, what was this stranger just doing before we turned the lantern on? Was he ruffling through his bag, looking for something? One of us says something to him, and once again, no response. My friend temporarily turns off the lantern. I assume it's because the battery is low and he doesn't want to wear it out. But once the light is out, the stranger in black unzips his backpack again and starts frantically looking through it again. My friend immediately turns the lantern back on. The stranger quickly stops and zips the backpack back up, acting like nothing is happening. My friend notices the stranger appears to be Hispanic, so he greets him in Spanish, as he also is Hispanic. This clearly takes the stranger off guard, and he mumbles in response. My friend asks how he's doing, what he's up to tonight, did he come for a swim, at least that's what I assume from his tone. I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know exactly what the stranger's responses were, but they were very brief and not very friendly. After asking a few more questions to the guy, my friend turns to me and our dates in the pool and says very quietly but dead serious, we need to go now. Immediately we start getting out of the pool and drying off with our towels. The stranger asks my friend in a question in Spanish something like, oh where are you guys going so quickly? And I surmise my friend is playing it off very calmly like it's no big deal. Again he turns to us as we're getting our things together and putting on our shoes, maybe not going as fast as we could. We don't have time grab your stuff. We're going now. We don't ask questions. We grab our things and start practically running towards the trailhead as a group. As we look back, we see the stranger in black getting his things together, getting up and starting to follow us. At this point, there is no illusion of what is happening. This guy has bad intentions and is chasing after us on this narrow trail back to our vehicle. We know we've got an hour or more ahead of us until we get back to the safety of our vehicle and we don't have anything to defend ourselves with at all. We're still wet. We got a head start on him, which was a big help. I took the lantern and took the lead of the group. We got into single file and lock hands with each other, knowing that we needed to keep moving as fast as we can, but not too fast or we could literally fall to our deaths. The girls were behind me, with my friend at the back, 
It was giving us updates of where the stranger in black was and telling us to move faster. He picked up the biggest, sharpest rock he could find and was prepared to defend us if he had to. I'm sure you can imagine the emotions that were running through all of us at the time. The girls are sobbing, trying to keep pace with me up front. I'm yelling back to them, watch out for this, watch out for that, as we're making our way in the darkness as fast as we can. I'm telling myself to stay calm so I don't scare the girls any more than they already are, while also feeling an overwhelming sense of dread that I don't want to die so young as I was only 19. After what feels like an eternity, we finally see the main canyon road in our truck. We all run towards it as my friend unlocks it and we all get inside. And we're all in shock at this point and just start shaking uncontrollably. I tell my friend to start the car and start driving so we can get out of there and just never come back. I ask my friend, the one who was speaking Spanish to the stranger, why did you tell us to get out of there so quickly? My friend answered that he purposely had been turning the lantern on and off because he noticed when he did, the stranger was searching in his bag for something, and when it came back on, the stranger closed it up fast and acted like he hadn't just been looking for something. And that was when he tried speaking in Spanish to get a feel for what was going on with the guy. My friend said he was asking the stranger some questions in Spanish like, Where are your friends? And the stranger answered, No friends. And other short answers to basic questions that gave my friend the absolute creeps. Once the stranger asked my friend something about the girls who were with us, that was when he told us we needed to get out of there. Apparently he was able to see the stranger following us almost the entire way out of the trail, but dropped off towards the end when he couldn't keep pace with us. What was that stranger doing in the middle of a dark canyon by himself, dressed in all black? What did he have in his bag that he was trying to get to, that he didn't want us to see? What would have happened to us if he would have caught up to our group on the trail that night? I live in a rather rural area, the kind of place where you both know what to expect and don't know what to expect. People here tend to be latched onto the older way of thinking and living and I'm all for that. That being said, it is easy to assume that nothing much happens here, at least nothing that would really raise any red flags. The thing is, about five years ago something abnormal did happen. Five years ago I thought I was going to lose my life due to a case of wrong place wrong time in the parking lot of an all-you-can-eat buffet. I was in middle school at the time and having one of the worst school years yet. Luck didn't seem to be on my side, so of course this day wouldn't be any different. My family, my grandpa, mom, and little sister, had gone to church that morning and taken my friend and her younger sister as well. Once it was over, my mom decided that we'd treat ourselves to an early lunch and headed over to a local all-you-can-eat buffet. It was a humble place and the atmosphere of the farm around it was peaceful. It lulled you into a sense of security. We were waiting in the lobby area, sitting on a bench, when two women came in. They both seemed to be in their forties. The taller woman was obviously the leader of the two and the shorter woman seemed to hang back, letting the other do the talking, chiming in here and there. The taller woman was gushing over how adorable my sister was to her. She was in elementary school at the time and kept saying how she looked like a princess. We thought she was just an overly expressive and nice woman, and left it at that as we walked to our table to get settled in. Fast forward, we were eating dessert. I had gotten my usual, that being a mixed vanilla and chocolate ice cream, topped off with Oreo bits, caramel, and two marshmallows covered in chocolate from the chocolate fountain. Yes, I know, I kind of went overboard, but whatever, I was a kid. I was about three-fourths of the way done with my dish when the two ladies suddenly appeared at our table. I immediately thought it was odd that they deliberately searched us out in there but kept eating. The lead woman got to talking about herself and revealed she was a church official. She claimed to work in a sort of crisis center at her church located in Delaware. She mainly worked with kids who were the victims of abuse. Her friend, I cannot remember exactly whether she actually told anything about herself but if she did, None of us can recall it. They then told my mom and grandpa that they had a gift for my sister, and I admit, I was kind of jealous upon hearing that. Of course, she was getting a gift. The woman pulled some letters out of her purse and showed them to my mom and sister. 
She told us that she was pen pals of a sort with Princess Kate. I later would learn from my mom that the letters were basically automatic replies, not actual letters from Kate herself. So nothing special, really. It's like the equivalent of getting the answering machine to a secretary in the mail. But nonetheless, my mom went along with it. Then, to my surprise, the woman said she had a gift for me. But unlike the gift from my sister, which had been in her purse, she said mine was put in her car. Red flags immediately went up in my head. There was no way I was going with this random lady alone out to her car. My mom to this day, I have no idea what she was thinking, told her that I could go so long as my grandpa went with me. My grandpa gave my mama, what are you talking about? Why should she go with them? Look and turn to me. I hesitated, but we walked out with the two women. At this point, knowing the head woman was a church official, I figured she was going to give me a Bible or something. My grandpa, he was in his late 50s at the time, seemed uneasy and stuck close to me. As we had approached her car, I saw that it was in fact not a car at all. It was a van. A white van. Cliché, I know, but it's the God-honest truth. We followed the two women over, and the leader walked over to the passenger side. We were right behind her, but had failed to notice the other woman lagging behind and placed herself between us in the exit between the van and the other car. The lead woman was in front of us, meaning we were boxed in, no way out. The leader unlocked her doors and pulled open the sliding door, ducking inside. My grandpa seemed to tense up, his eyes darting around. He had noticed the other woman was blocking us off and was on edge. He had a bad feeling about this and was fully prepared to fight these women to save me if need be. Then, something I never would have dreamed of happened. The woman, after rummaging around in her van, emerged wielding a sword. And not some fake prop sword that you get at Party City or something. A legit sword, glinting in the grey autumn light, its hilt adorned with details and jewels. I just about soiled my pants. I thought this was the end. I was going to die by the blade of some psychotic church official in the parking lot of a rural buffet. My grandpa's eyes went wide, and I saw his hands clench into fists, and he prepared to knock this woman out. This seemed to go in slow motion, taking forever, but was only a few seconds. And then as my life flashed before my eyes, this woman asked us what her names were. The sword was still in her hand, and she didn't swing it at us. I was terrified, thinking the woman was the kind of killer who likes to know her victim's names before doing the deed. I told her my name. She then performed a small ceremony, reciting some religious statements and lowered the blade to touch both of my shoulders, one at a time. She then brought it down to my head and raised it, bringing it in front of herself, straight into the air, and proclaimed me, Sir, insert my name, a knight of God. She asked the same of my grandpa, and after getting his name, did the same for him. She told us that she hoped we liked our gifts, and still shell-shocked, we thanked her, and my grandpa and I left the two women. We speed walked inside, found our table, and proceeded to fill my mom in on what just happened. She didn't believe us at first, but we soon convinced her. My grandpa and I both scolded her for making us go with those women. My grandpa was especially angry. If that woman had other intentions with that sword, we both would be dead. The women didn't come back over to us, and oddly enough, we didn't see them when leaving. We never saw those women again, and suffice to say, I'm glad. They weirded me out, and I just hoped they went back to Delaware where they belonged. Maybe they could knight some other random strangers along the way. It's been half a decade now since the day my grandpa and I were proclaimed knights, my close friends sometimes refer to me as Sir, insert my name, which I find funny. I never let my mom live that down either, prodding her about it whenever I get the chance, all in good fun of course. It's also a fantastic story to tell people and get them interested in you, and no one I've met has been able to top me when we get to sharing. Now one last thing that has always lingered in the back of my mind, something that still unsettles me to this day. About two weeks prior to this event, there had been some beheadings a few states over that made the news. It makes me wonder, could it have been those two ladies? Was I knighted by a murderer?
so this was when I was around seven. My younger sister was four and my older sister was 14. I wasn't the brightest, but then again I was seven. I live in the UK. We went to Tesco, this big shop, with her parents and me and my little sister got separated from our parents and older sister because we needed to go to the toilet. My older sister sort of came with us but didn't fully come all the way to the toilets. The toilets are near the entrance of the shop. It was quite big as well, so it was easy to get lost. Anyway, me and my sister finished going to the toilet and whatnot, and we came out and saw our sister wasn't there, so we weren't really sure what to do. We were looking around to see where she was. This was all whilst we were near the entrance. At the same time, some red-headed guy with wellies approached us, and he told us that he'd help us. I can't fully remember how he knew we were looking for our sister because it was a while ago, but I remember him saying, I can take you to your sister, yeah? So he held our hands and started walking the opposite way where we were supposed to go inside the shop. I don't really remember what me and my little sister did. I think we just kept walking with him, unfortunately. At around the same time, our older sister saw us walking out and came up to us and said to the man, Oh, thanks for helping them, but... I can take them back to our parents. And she held her hands and took us back. It was quite unusual, I guess, but that's what I remember. I did bring it up to my older sister a few months ago, and she says she remembers it, and the guy definitely was trying something shady. This happened a long time ago. Over 10 years back, and I hadn't thought about it much until a few similar posts jogged my memories, so I thought I'd share it now. My boyfriend, now husband, and I had recently moved into our first place together, and we were still settling in after a month or two. It was a large suite in an older high-rise building that was attached to three other buildings in the same complex via an attached underground area which included a gym, some stores, and a pub. Super weird, but... A lot of the tenants were long-timers and frequented the businesses down there since it was convenient. All buildings also shared on-site security, located in the same weird underground lair. We had nothing to compare it to, but looking back on it, the place was incredibly weird and there were some minor red flags before we even moved in. When we first met the building manager to view the place, we couldn't view the actual unit because the current tenant wouldn't allow the manager into the suite. She showed us the identical unit one floor down and assured us that the lock would be changed, all carpets would be replaced, and that the place would be painted so we didn't need to worry about any damage or anything. I would never move into a place unseen now, but at the time we were young and dumb and just wanted to get out of our parents' house, so we agreed and arranged to move in. Luckily the place was really nice and in good shape when we moved in, so that didn't end up being a problem. The suite itself was great, but the other tenants on our floor were really odd. Most of them have lived there for years and didn't leave their apartment much and weren't particularly friendly. The guy next door was around our age, but played EDM 24 hours a day at full blast. How he slept, I'll never know. So, we often had security pounding on our door for misdirected noise complaints. Turned out, that was about all security was there for, as they came up a lot due to complaints from the units below us. I don't think it was ever once due to us making noise, but who knows. The building managers were also super weird and always up in everyone's business. She patrolled the hallways daily and asked super personal questions, then acted offended if you didn't want to answer them. She was another one who'd lived there forever and was a bit of a drunk on building manager power or something. In general, the vibe was just awkward there. We both worked jobs at the time that had us starting early in the morning and finishing up work in the early afternoon, and this day was no different. We were both home by 3pm and hanging out in the apartment watching TV. I watch and read a lot of scary stuff and am a bit paranoid, so I always made it a habit to lock both the deadbolt and security chain from the inside of the front door when we were both at home. This day was no exception. Eventually our late afternoon TV watching shifted into early evening intimacy and afterwards we both drifted off since we had woken up so early for work that day. I was in and out of sleep so the background noise of the apartment was slipping in and out of my consciousness. I could hear the TV every so often and at one point I stirred awake because I could have sworn I heard the sound of the door unlocking. 
I glanced in the direction of the door once I opened my eyes, but looked closely and didn't hear any further noises like knocking or anyone in the hallway. I figured I must have heard something on the television rather than in the apartment and fell back asleep. We both woke up about an hour later and my boyfriend mentioned that he woke up at one point because he could have sworn he heard someone trying to get into the apartment. This seemed way too weird to be a coincidence, so we both got up to examine the door and see what the noise could have been. Someone had indeed unlocked the door. The deadbolt was unlocked, even though we both saw that it was locked that afternoon after I got home, and the door was propped open on the frame resting against the security chain which was still secured. This spooked us both since whoever it was obviously had a key, it didn't knock or announce their presence before trying to enter the unit. They also didn't try to cover up the fact that they had tried to come in, as it was super obvious that they had tried to gain access but couldn't. That part bothered me the most because I wondered what would happen if they tried again and we weren't home, or maybe they had been inside already prior to that day. We never found out who it was, and to this day I have no idea if they tried to gain access at any other point. Nothing ever seemed out of place or removed, so it's impossible to know for sure. We lived there for almost two years afterwards and didn't have another experience like this one. Plenty of other weird and annoying ones, but none this creepy. The only people who should have had copies of the keys to our unit would be the building manager and possibly security or maintenance workers, but any of those individuals should have announced their presence and notified us if they needed to come into our unit. They also had in the past, so no reason to think this situation would be any different. And no one knocked later that night or any other day that week or the next, which I would expect if one of the parties needed something from us or access to our unit. The only other theory I have is that maybe it was the weird former tenant who still had keys to the place if the manager was dishonest about changing the locks. Or maybe he made extra copies or something. No clue why he'd come back and that seems like the most far-fetched explanation but also the creepiest. I wish I knew since it still bugs me that we never figured out this mystery before we moved. Whoever it was, we were all lucky the security chain was secured that day, or that would have been a very awkward and nudity-filled home invasion. We were on a family holiday abroad years ago, I think I was 14 at the time, my sister's 16 at the time and the toddler was our cousin. She was maybe two years old, maybe a bit older. So we headed out during the evening to have dinner and just after that we'll walk through the towns and maybe stop at a few bars for drinks. As we're walking through this town, a man who was, I'll say, badly dressed as a clown approached my sister. Bear in mind my sister is afraid of clowns, no matter how good or badly dressed they are. She was carrying our cousin on her hip and the clown looked at our cousin and said hello to her, making her laugh as clowns do. My sister, on the other hand, just froze. I was standing by watching this happening, kind of laughing at the fact that my sister was soiling herself. I was kind of a savage sister. And next thing without asking or anything, he takes my cousin from my sister, and then of course I thought, whoa, hey. I shouted over to my parents and my aunt and uncle, my dad comes over and says, hey, what do you think you're doing with my niece? As he was trying to get her back out of his arms, but when he tried to get her, the clown would just turn away or push my dad back. The clown says, I thought you'd like to take a photo. Do you not want to take a photo? My aunt comes over, but scared out of her mind, thinking that clowns are trying to kidnap her daughter. We all just gather around the clown, trying to pry my cousin from this clown's arms, but every time... He just kept pulling away or pushing back. And the next thing my dad had enough, he approached the clown and said, Let go of my niece right now, and grabbed him by the neck. In the end, he put her down, and my dad picks her up and hands her to his sister-in-law. And the guy just casually says, Oh, okay, too bad. You don't want to take a photo. And hands my cousin a lollipop. We just headed back to the hotel, Kind of thought nothing of it, but the next day we saw him again as we were at a restaurant. This time he took someone else's kid, like away from the parents, into some room. My dad had spotted him as he came out of the toilets and stopped him, 
thinking he grabbed my cousin again, but it was someone else. But he headed back to the table and ate his dinner, but then for a second he felt something wasn't right, so he went back to the clown's room. I didn't know what went down when he went back, but he came back out holding this other kid's hand and asked her where her parents were, assuming that they were in the same restaurant, but they weren't. They were at some other place. My dad took the kid back to her parents and said, don't let that clown anywhere near your kids, and told them what they tried to do with my cousin. My name is Shen. I live in France. It was 2017 when the story happened. We had my half-brother and I, 18 and 19 years old, living in France, only the mother of my half-brother, she lives in Morocco, and so every year we spend a little time and stay there as he goes to see her. I had my license at the time, so we had the idea to go by car and go through Spain in order to visit a bit. We take the road from the French Riviera, three days of driving we expect, including of course the two nights at the hotel. Everything is going well in Spain. It is time to take the boat from the port of Malaga to go to Morocco where we arrive in Tangier. It is around 5.30 when we arrived at the hotel in Rabat, city of Morocco. We are settling in there, everything is fine, and this is where things start to get weird. In booking our room, the hostess was very helpful and professional. However, with my brother, we are starting to find it quite curious. What time exactly are you leaving tomorrow? Do you plan to take breaks on the road? Where exactly are you going? Where exactly is your car parked? She tells us to clean the car. We just make the remark between my brother and I without really dwelling on it. The hostess asks us which road we are planning to take to get to Marrakech. She suggested we take the road towards Casablanca and is very insistent there without giving us time to answer. She told us that it will allow us to see beautiful landscapes, and unfortunately, we followed their advice. The day is breaking. The car has not been watched, but in short, my brother and I are very tired. We slept until noon that day. We decided to visit Tangier a little before hitting the road. It's 10 p.m., and after eating, we decided to hit the road. I prefer driving at night. It makes me more comfortable in these conditions. Everything is going well. We listen to music. We take breaks on some kind of highway. Having dragged around a bit, it's getting late. We have three hours of road left before arriving. It's around midnight, and then we're back on the road. On the highway, there are very high lampposts, some of which were not functional, so there were many areas where it was quite dark. I decided to be extra vigilant, continuing, and... I saw a group, around seven, behind security guardrails. I saw them quite quickly, but they were crouching as if though they were trying to hide while watching the road. My brother at the time was asleep. I keep driving without really asking myself a question, but I found it strange. I put myself in full headlights, and the second I do, I see a man in the right lane. I had to go at 120 to 130 kilometers per hour on the center lane. I slowed down and reduced my speed to about 100 kilometers per hour. The man in question must have been his 40s, and there he rushes to my car and throws a rock, a rather big stone, into my windshield. I crushed the brake pedal, in the incomprehension of what had just happened, under the shock I stopped by removing my belt, and by reflex my eyes it directs towards the rearview mirror. I see a dozen people running towards my car. I could not see really well, knowing that it was dark, but I saw that they did not present with empty hands. They had sticks and picks and various weapons. And overtaken with fear, I clicked my seatbelt and crushed the accelerator pedal. I speak to my brother at that moment while looking in the rear view. He doesn't answer. I turn my gaze to him and he's unconscious. His skull is wide open. Blood is flowing. The stone that had been launched is at his feet. Lost, I don't know what to do. I try to put my hand at the level of the impact that he had on the skull to reduce the blood flowing while driving. I cry out his first name, but he doesn't respond and doesn't react. And it's late, and there's nobody on the road. And the cars that I see, they don't stop. 
I don't know where we are. Where is the hospital? What am I going to do? A man comes up to me. He looks at me. I wave to him that I need help, and he stops. I speak in Arabic. I understand it, but to speak, I have to reflect on my words, and in panic, it's not possible, but thankfully, he speaks French. I explain the situation to him, and he tells me that he'll come with me to my car and guide me to the hospital, that he just has to get his phone in his car, and that we'll come back to his car by taxi. The situation is strange. It was cold, and why not just guide me from his car? With my brother in the hospital in mind as my only goal, I didn't think about it and accepted. He climbs in the back and I start to ride. He says apologetically for not introducing himself his name is Saeed, and to take the first exit after about 10 kilometers. I introduce myself in turn by giving my first name. I heard a beep come from within the car. It's the phone he went to pick up in his car except that it wasn't a phone but a walkie-talkie and all the questions start to multiply in my head. They speak Arabic, and I kind of understand them. I'm Algerian, and the Moroccans have the same language with a few words, except that he doesn't know it. Saeed said to his interlocutor while speaking Arabic, It's not them. It's not them. It's not the right first name. The man asks him if he is sure, and Saeed tells him that, Yes, she told us the first name, Mark. The guy responds, he saw your face. Will we have to get rid of him anyway? And gives him an address to follow. I'm frozen. I look at my brother who still isn't moving. I try to find a solution to get out of this situation and I try to keep calm. Saeed tells me not to take the planned exit but the next one he tells me it will be easier. So I follow this instruction. If I had refused he surely would have suspected something and... We exited the planned exit, and two minutes passed. It was the two longest minutes of my life. I see a vehicle that appears to belong to or a captain police brigade. It's necessary to let them know that I'm in danger, but how do I say it? I decide to put myself at their level, but Saeed says I must do that. And I'm trapped. I'm five meters away. I decide to make a single call of the headlight to attract their attention, and... They see the windshield totally broken, so they stop me. Saeed raises the tone, and I say to be careful and not to start over, but it's too late. They signal me to stop, and I stop. Saeed tells me, it's not over, and runs away from the car. They were gendarmes. I go to them in a panic and explain the situation as best I can in Arabic. They call an ambulance, which arrives quickly. My brother is brought to the hospital and he is immediately transferred to France to the military hospital in which he will be plunged into an artificial coma for three weeks. His skull had been broken on the right side above his eye. He lost sight of the right eye. Thankfully, today everything is better, and he regained his sight little by little. Saeed has not been found, but the man who threw the stone that weighed in at 6.4 kilograms was found and identified. He is known for several beatings in an organized gang, and he's serving a 40-year sentence, and the most shocking is yet to come. The woman who was the hostess was part of the coup, but she disappeared. The inspector explained their way of working to me. The hostess spots people passing by the hotel, who she knows are foreigners. When she asks where their car is, it is to transmit the license plate and so they can recognize the target and that's why she insisted that we take the road to Casablanca. They rob people, get rid of them, and take their cars. However, I explained the conversation between Saeed and the man who threw the stone. When he told him, it's not them, it's not them, it's not the right name, the inspector told me that they were very lucky then, and that he could not explain the situation to me on that, but surely he knew the reasons. I decided to do some research on my own, and there has already been stories like this where families with infants were attacked, and only the infants disappear. In the end, I think that they were wrong because when the hostess asked us what time we were going to leave, I said that we were leaving around 5 p.m., but we only left the hotel at 5. We got on the road at 10 p.m. They had our license plate, but not the people they expected, and the group of criminals were probably expecting other people than us.
My terrifying story happened when I was about 16. I'm now almost 21. I've stayed at home only by myself for two days. It wasn't something unusual or scary at all, but that night I'll remember for the rest of my life. About 11 p.m., I'd been on my phone talking with my friend when I heard a strange noise outside. It was like someone or something hitting the bin. I thought that maybe it was the neighbor's cat. I told my friend about that and she laughed and said that maybe it was a ghost. We started joking about that. About an hour later, we finished our conversation. I checked downstairs if all the doors are closed and decided to go to sleep. I brushed my teeth and turned off all the lights. When I was lying in bed, I realized I left my phone downstairs and I had to bring it back. When I got down from the staircase, I looked at the big windows in the living room and froze in fear. In the window, I saw a black silhouette of a human just standing on the patio, staring right into the house. I was so scared that I couldn't even move. After a while, I sprinted to the kitchen, grabbed the phone and called my uncle. He's a police officer and lives at the same streets, and I was terrified that I only whispered to him, someone's standing on the patio. When my uncle arrived, the men on the patio saw a car and began to take off. My uncle hadn't managed to catch him. Then he came into my house and tried to calm me down because I've immediately bursted into tears when I saw him. That night, my uncle stayed at my house and told my aunt to take care of me in their house. Just a few days later, when my parents came home, I got a call from my uncle who told me that just a day ago there was a man standing on the patio of his neighbor's house and the police caught him. He said also that supposedly this man is insane because he kept saying, I can see you and laugh the entire time. Well, after several years, I'm still thinking what would happen if I hadn't come downstairs. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, cats and sweaters are always better. <laughs>